Dear ladies and gentlemen, in the following 20 minutes I would like to talk to you about our long-term experience of cochlear implantation in single-sided deaf patients. Now, before I move on with the presentation, I would like to give you a short introduction of who am I, who is the cochlear implant team that I'm working with, uh, we as a member of the hearing group, and then I will go through the presentation. So first, a definition of single-sided deafness, what's in a name, what's the definition of single-sided deafness. Then part three and four, we'll discuss our long-term results of cochlear implantation in single-sided deafness. So mainly we will focus on the tinnitus suppression in our patients as well as on the improved spatial hearing capabilities. And then at the end of the presentation, I will give a summary of the presentation. So first of all, my name is Griet Mertens. I'm coordinating the cochlear implant research program at the Antwerp University Hospital. Uh, I did my PhD about three years ago in 2015, and it was on this topic, so on single-sided deafness in cochlear implantation. Uh, as you can see on the slides, our cochlear implant team is a multi disciplinary environment. So first of all, there are of course the surgeons. The head of the department is Professor van der Heining. Then there are the fitting audiologists, some additional professionals, like there are the speech language pathologists, the neurophysiologists, oral rehabilitation specialists, psychologists, social workers, and so on. And it's only with a very close communication between those stakeholders, between those disciplines, that we can uh, offer a good care for our cochlear implant patient. And it's not only a close communication between our in-house disciplines, it's also a close communication within the hearing network. And the hearing network, it's um, a network of 30 experts worldwide uh, in the field of hearing implants. And one of the aims of this hearing network, for example, is um, to assess minimal outcome measures, standards and so on, just to provide each potential implant user with the best possible hearing implant or hearing solution. And I'm also happy to say that this hearing network group is not just including only ENT surgeons, but also other uh, skilled professionals like there are audiologists, for example. Now let's move on to the definition of single-sided deafness. And for the definition of single-sided deafness, I would like to refer to the consensus paper of the hearing. And in that consensus paper, you can read the definition of single-sided deafness. So it's having one normal or semi-normal hearing ear in one side and a deaf ear in the contralateral side. And a normal hearing ear, we can define it with a pure tone average of 30 dB HL or better. And then the deaf ear is defined as a pure tone average of 70 dB HL or worse. Then there are also the patients with the asymmetric hearing loss, the same deaf ear, so 70 dB HL or worse, but in the contralateral side they are having a mild to moderate hearing loss. A mild to moderate hearing loss is defined as having a pure tone average between 30 dB HL and 55 dB HL. Here you find an overview of the four main treatments options for today, uh, as there are for single-sided deafness. First of all, there's the do-nothing solution, as far as we can call it a solution, of course. Then there are the well-known cross-traditional hearing aids, bone conduction devices, and then a fourth solution for single-sided deafness uh, is the cochlear implantation. And in this presentation, I will mainly talk about uh, the cochlear implantation solution. Although several studies have shown that cochlear implantation is a safe and a re reliable uh, solution for single-sided deafness, uh, there are a lot of studies uh, discussing the results of single-sided deafness and cochlear implantation, but the outcome measures across these studies, they vary highly. So that is why we need a unified testing framework for single-sided deafness. Because only with a consistent use of a defined outcome measure across centers, high-level evidence can be generated. So that is why within the hearing group we came up with a unified testing framework. And on this slide you see an overview of the four main parts that should be included in a multi-test battery for testing single-sided deaf patients. First of all, there's a speech perception in noise testing should be included in a minimal test battery. Then there's sound localization testing. 
questionnaires to investigate quality of life and if applicable also questionnaires related to the tinnitus of the patients. Here you find an overview of our publications regarding the results I will show to you in a minute. So let's have a look at our included patients. We included 23 subjects who were suffering from single-sided deafness, so they were having one normal or semi-normal hearing ear. And in the contralateral side, they were single-sided deaf and therefore implanted with a cochlear implant. Now, before I move on, I want to stress out that it's very important that all of our patients were included because of their major complaint, which was the tinnitus, so the ipsilateral incapacitating tinnitus, not the single-sided deafness, but really the major complaint of having the cochlear implant was the tinnitus. We divided our patients into two categories. First of all, there are the patients with the single-sided deafness, so with the normal hearing ear in one side, deaf in the contralateral side. And then there are the patients with the asymmetric hearing loss, so with having a mild to moderate hearing loss in one ear and deaf in the contralateral side. This is a very important slide with the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. They are very, very important to achieve the benefits of the treatment, so to have the tinnitus suppression in the end. First of all, the patient must suffer from a subjective tinnitus, which is due to the ipsilateral profound sensorineural hearing loss. The tinnitus must be their primary complaint, like mentioned before. Uh, the patient must rate their tinnitus loudness on a visual analog scale more than 6 out of 10 on a visual analog scale, but this for more than 6 months. Of course, patient must have realistic expectations. Standard treatments of tinnitus may not have any effect in the past. Patient, of course, must have a patent scala tympani to allow cochlear implantation. And like I mentioned before, a normal hearing in the contralateral side or a mild to moderate hearing loss. Then some very important exclusion criteria. First of all, patients with a major depression are excluded from the study. Also patients with an objective tinnitus or with a somatic tinnitus are excluded. Uh, and then patients who are not willing to attend regular follow-up or rehabilitation sessions afterwards are also excluded. Uh, for this study, we were not including patients with a tinnitus duration of more than 10 years. Uh, that was just because it was more than 10 years ago. I know nowadays there are new upcoming studies including patients with tinnitus duration of more than 10 years or deafnesses of more than 10 years. However, for this, um, for this long follow-up study, we did not include duration of tinnitus of more than 10 years. One of the questions at the long-term test interval, and this long-term test interval was on average 10 years after implantation, the question was how often do you still wear your cochlear implant? And then all of our patients reported that they wear their implant seven days a week. One of them is wearing the implant five hours a day on average, but the majority, 96%, they report that they switch on the cochlear implant as soon as they get up in the morning and they only switch it off again just before going to bed at night. The methods that we've used for our long follow-up study are shown on this slide. So we were using the tinnitus questionnaire to assess the tinnitus burden of uh, our patients and we were also assessing the tinnitus loudness visual analog scale to assess the tinnitus loudness in our patients. This um, visual analog scale is a scale going from 0 up until 10. 0, quiet, no tinnitus, up until 10, very loud, cannot get any worse. And here I will show you the results. So on the vertical axis, the visual analog scale, the lower the rating, the better the benefit, of course. And on the horizontal axis, you see the different time intervals. So pre-op up until the long-term test interval, which was on average 10 years after implantation. And as you can see, there's a nice improvement up until three months after activation. And this benefit remains stable for the very long time of follow-up. Now, if we have a look at the long-term test interval, when our patients take off the implant again, then the tinnitus loudness comes back in the same degree as prior to cochlear implantation. And then the results from the tinnitus questionnaire. Again, on the vertical axis, the lower the score, the better the benefit or the more benefit of the tinnitus reduction. And on the horizontal axis, the different time intervals going from pre-op again up until the long-term test interval. 
And there we also find the same results, so a significant improvement up until three months after activation of the cochlear implant, and also this benefit remains stable for the longer term of follow-up. Another question that we asked at the long-term test interval was whether still the tinnitus is reported as the primary advantage of having their cochlear implant, or whether the primary advantage has switched to the improved hearing capabilities. And there we found that our single-sided deaf subjects indeed report still that tinnitus is still their primary advantage of having their cochlear implant, whereas in the patients with the asymmetric hearing loss, now the improved hearing capabilities has become the primary advantage of having their cochlear implant. So tinnitus suppression was the main reason for cochlear implantation and as you could see in the previous slide there was a nice significant tinnitus suppression over time. But in addition to the tinnitus suppression, improved spatial hearing capabilities can also be expected after cochlear implantation in uh, single-sided deafness. So that's what, why we also wanted to test those spatial hearing capabilities. Now what's the definition of spatial hearing? It's the capacity of the auditory system to interpret different spatial paths by which sounds may reach the head. So by using those spatial hearing, a person is able to understand speechy noise and also a patient is able to localize where the sound is coming from. So we want to test those spatial hearing cues in our single-sided deaf CI recipients and I will first guide you through the speech reception uh, in noise results. So there are four main binaural cues or semi-binaural cues, for example summation effect, the ability to listen with two ears to one sound source, it can achieve in normal hearing listeners a benefit up until 6 dB. Then there's a squelch effect, um, the ability to extract input of non-informative background noise from information coming to the people. Uh, then there's the head shadow effect and spatial release from masking. Those are all binaural or semi-binaural effects, so when a patient is having only one ear, he cannot benefit from the summation effect nor from the squelch effect and only partially from the head shadow effect and from spatial release from masking. So that's why we want to test those binaural cues in our single-sided deaf CI recipients. And indeed we found a significant summation effect, a summation benefit of 1.3 dB in our patients. We didn't find a squelch effect, we did find a head shadow effect and spatial release from masking up until 3.3 dB. Besides those binaural effects, we also wanted to test whether having a noise at the single-sided deaf-aided side is influencing the speech perception. Especially in these challenging environments, you can expect that when having noise at the deaf side is a benefit, but having noise at the deaf side and the deaf side is aided, it can be a, a disadvantage. So we wanted to test those challenging environments. So on the slide you can see on the vertical axis the speech in noise, the lower the better the speech perception, and we wanted to test it for an unaided condition, a condition with a bone conduction device, and a condition with a cochlear implant. And luckily we didn't find a significant influence of having the cochlear implant on in those challenging environments. So good news. Then we also tried it with having a bone conduction device aided at the single-sided deaf side of our patients and then we found a significant deterioration when having a bone conduction device in those single-sided deaf patients in these challenging environments. Now, besides listening to speech in noise, another spatial hearing capability is um, localized from where the sound is coming from, so sound localization, and we also assessed these abilities in our single-sided deaf CI recipients. In the Antwerp University Hospital, we are using a sound localization setup of uh, nine loudspeakers going from uh, minus 90 degrees up until plus 90 degrees. This is how it looks like in real life and for this uh, study we were using a broadband noise stimulus. So this is a slide where we normally would put um, the results of a localization test so on the horizontal axis the target azimuth where the sound is coming from, the vertical axis the response so where the person thinks the sound is coming from and then it will result 
in a diagonal when a person is perfectly able to localize where the sound is coming from. Here you can see an example of a patient, a single-sided deaf patient without a cochlear implant. And as you can see, the data points are lying not close to the diagonal. So this patient is not able to localize where the sound is coming from. He's got a, a sound localization error of 106. But then when he switches on the cochlear implant, you see that the data points are coming closer to the diagonal and the uh, localization error decreases to 37 degrees. Now let's have a look at the overall localization results of our population. Again, for the single-sided deaf patients, as well as for the patients with asymmetric hearing loss, the vertical axis, the localization error, so the lower the error, the better the localization ability. And then the dotted line represents the chance level of our setup. And if we then have a look at the monaural uh, conditions, we see that the patients are performing worse than Charles level, so they are not able to localize where the sound is coming from. And with the monaural conditions, I mean a CI only condition, so where we plucked and muffed the contralateral normal hearing side, or a condition with only the normal hearing ear and without the cochlear implant. But then, when they switch on the cochlear implant, they switch to a binaural condition, and then we see a nice significant improvement for the sound localization abilities. So based on this overview, based on these uh, studies, we can conclude that cochlear implantation in single-sided deafness and incapacitating tinnitus can improve the hearing capabilities, like there are speech perception in noise and sound localization, and in a specific population, it can also decrease the tinnitus loudness. So unilateral hearing loss is nowadays a new indication for cochlear implantation, and since 2013 also CE marked in children and in adults as well. And then with this final slide, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me directly.